Hello again. We've come to a lecture that we've all been waiting for now because the convention in the Do Hotel, right, in Japan is going to get started. Japanese civilization comes quite a bit after India and China uh, start their civilizations. There were people living in the Japanese islands for thousands of years, of course, but it wasn't until the 6th century AD that they developed the level of social and government organization that we usually associate with the term civilization. The transition seems to be connected with political developments on the Asian mainland. In the 6th century, some of the ruling clans of Japan adopted Chinese models of scholarship, of religion, and governance. The contact with Chinese culture most often came through Korea, which is the closest point of the Asian mainland to, to Japan. So a quick historical recap of what's going on in East Asia in the 6th century. In China, they've become unified again after three centuries of competing kingdoms and civil war under the, the Sui and then the Tang dynasties. In Korea, this is the time of the three kingdoms, but Shila is on the move and is going to take over most of that. Um, Shila has a connection with, with China, and Buddhism is the official religion there. Um, there was a loss of, of Japanese domains in Korea, and now Japan is starting to see itself as being rather weak and decentralized. Something needs to change. There were three great gifts that came from China to Japan through Korea. The first was a writing system. So the Japanese used Chinese characters to write their language, even though Chinese and Japanese are not related languages at all. Um, so when I talk about the Do Hotel, that's the, the Japanese version of the Chinese pronunciation of Dao. That same character can also be read as Michi, which also means road or something, but it's in, in a more traditional Japanese pronunciation. The second great gift that comes from China is Buddhism. And there are monks and statues that are sent from one of the three Korean kingdoms into Japan, one of the, the uh, prominent clans, um, the Soga clan adopts Buddhism and then when they become prominent, uh, Buddhism is going to flourish in Japan. And the third gift is the ideal of a unified government under an emperor. So Japan's going to have an emperor even though it's a different sort of empire than we've seen before. In other places, these empires take in huge territories and multiple ethnicities and languages and customs. Japan is a much more homogenized place, but they do have an emperor. The Japanese borrowed a great deal from China, but they borrowed selectively. They ignored some aspects of Chinese culture, like, say, eunuchs. That just didn't make any sense to them. So there aren't eunuchs in Jap in the Japanese, around the Japanese emperor. And then they took other uh, uh, cultural traditions from China and merged them with local traditions, such as those that were associated with the native religion of Japan called Shinto that has myths about the origins of the Japanese divinities in the islands, purification rituals, and a notion of kami, that these beings uh, with spiritual power, divinities, but also great mountains or sometimes old trees or even people might have some degree of kami to them, spiritual power. Um, one of, an example of this sort of hybrid culture is the Japanese were wary of mandate of heaven theories which after all justified rebellion in some circumstances. Remember we talked about that with Mencius. Consequently, they've had only one dynasty through their entire history. The current emperor of Japan, Emperor Akihito, is a direct descendant of emperors in the 6th century. And the royal clan traces its origins, its lineage, back to the Japanese sun goddess Amaterasu. Um, actually, one reason for this institutional longevity is that Japanese emperors have often reigned but not ruled. Sometimes the most powerful person in Japan made himself the shogun and had his own government. Okay, in China, that person would just kick out the old family, start a new dynasty, but in Japan, the royal family continues in a sort of, in a, in a figurehead sort of role. Okay, we're going to talk about one of the foremost advocates of Chinese-style reform, and that's Prince Shotohoku. He lived from 573 to 621, which makes him about a contemporary of Muhammad. Shotoku was the nephew and also regent for the reigning Empress Sueiko. So she ascends the throne in 592 when her half-brother was assassinated. She's about 40 years old and her nephew, Shotoku, is 20. And together they'll work together to bring order to China. She has a 36-year reign. It's the longest until the Meiji Emperor in the 19th century. Prince Shotoku set about bringing in Chinese-style 
court ranks. He adopted the Chinese calendar. He sent students and diplomatic missions to China. He's also remembered for one of Japan's most famous insults. He wrote a letter to the, to the Chinese emperor saying, and addressed it from the ruler of the land where the sun rises to the ruler of the land where the sun sets. Sort of a, you know, you're a declining power and we're a rising power. I don't know that he did that intentionally. He actually really respected China. But the Sui emperor was not impressed by that, said those, those Japanese barbarians need to learn some manners. Today, however, Shotoku is most famous for his 17-article constitution that he put forward in 604. Okay. We're not sure that he's the author. There's some scholarly debate about that. There may have been some contributions from Korean refugees who knew Chinese and knew something about Chinese culture. But we'll give Shotoku credit for this, since it does seem to fit the kind of ideas and the general pattern of his, of his um, regency. This 17-article constitution is not like the U.S. Constitution, which specifies a particular government structure and the functions and powers of different branches of government. Shotoku's constitution is a list of basic principles or moral injunctions. There are 17 of, of them, and perhaps that has to do with the Book of Changes, since 8 is the largest yin number and 9 is the largest yang, yang number, and you put those together and you get 17. Let me give you an example of, of how this sounds. And when you listen to this, I want you to think if you can identify aspects that are from Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, or legalism. It starts out in this way. Harmony is to be valued and an avoidance of wanton opposition to be honored. All men are influenced by class feeling and there are few who are intelligent. Hence, there are some who disobey their lords and fathers or who maintain feuds with the neighboring villages. But when those above are harmonious and those below are friendly and there's a concord in the discussion of business, right views of things spontaneously gain acceptance. Okay, notice this hierarchy, higher and lower, and then cooperation and harmony. The second, um, the second article of this constitution starts, sincerely reverence the three treasures, the Buddha, the law, that's going to be the Buddhist teachings, and the Sangha, the community of monks and nuns. Okay, that's obviously Buddhist. Um, article number three, when you receive the imperial commands, fail not scrupulously to obey them. Okay. Be obedient to the emperor. Uh, we're going to see that theme again, so keep that one in mind. The Lord is heaven, the vassal is earth. Heaven overspreads, the earth upbears. When this is so, the four seasons follow their due course, and the powers of nature obtain their efficacy. Um, so maybe some Taoist notions of harmony with nature in there. Other articles talk about rule by example, about avoiding covetous desires, about punishing the evil and rewarding the good, sounds sort of legalist, making sure that the responsibilities of the ministers are clear, employing the people's labor in accordance with their seasons. Notice that there's not really anything from Shinto here. It's very much borrowing of Chinese culture. It's very eclectic, it's practical, and they're borrowing but also adapting. There's an emphasis on harmony and the smooth resolution of conflict. Prince Shotoku also wrote a commentary on the Lotus Sutra, a Buddhist scripture that became the most important religious text in Japanese history. From, it's from the Mahayana tradition. Remember, the Tentai Buddhists thought that the Lotus Sutra was the highest sutra, the highest level of sutra that the Buddha ever gave. It was translated from Sanskrit into Chinese in the third century. And then the Buddha taught the sermon. This is the way it starts, um, setting the situation. He taught the sermon to 12,000 monks, 6,000 nuns were listening, along with 8,000 bodhisattvas, and 60,000 gods were all tuning into this sermon. As the Buddha spoke, a ray of light came from his forehead and illuminated 18,000 worlds, in each of which a Buddha was preaching. The messages of the Lotus Sutra are that the Buddha is eternal, that salvation is universal, and the three vehicles are one. There's also a story a famous parable of a burning house. There was a merchant, a well-off merchant, who had many sons, a large house, and his house caught on fire. As he saw the flames start to go up, he wanted to get his sons, but he knew that he couldn't go around and grab them all individually, so he needed to tempt them to come out. So he promised three sorts of things to different sons. To some sons, he promised a goat cart. Um, just think of it like a big wheel tricycle, maybe, for the really young ones. To other sons, he promised deer carts, that might be like a motorcycle, 
and to other sons, maybe the older ones, he, he promised um, ox carts. The equivalent might be like a muscle car, like a Mustang or something. They come out um, responding to those promises, and he actually gives them all something much better and all the same thing. He gives them a Maserati sports car, let's say. And then he asks the question, is anybody going to be disappointed in that? The idea is that the Buddha uses skillful means. He teaches different things to different people at different times, depending on their spiritual prog receptivity or their, their level. But in the end, he offers enlightenment to all of them, which is the same. Everyone gets the same, but it's much more wonderful than anything that they can imagine. Okay, this is a harmonious way of resolving the conflicts between different Buddhist schools. Today, Prince Shotoku often heads the list of the most admired individuals in Japanese history. He's seen as a key figure in the development of the spirit of Wa, that's harmony. Remember, it starts with, the Constitution starts, harmony is to be valued. And then number 17 of that, uh, the last article says, decisions on important matters should not be made by one person alone. They should be discussed with many. The idea of collective decision making, of consensus, of teamwork, a strong sense of community, those are very significant in Japanese business practices and in management techniques. Um, actually, they're important in Japanese baseball. There was a, a book written a few years ago called You Gotta Have Wa, which talked about the dilemma of American baseball players who went to play in Japanese leagues and then were sort of put off and, and felt very alien when they didn't quite fit into this Japanese notion of teamwork and consensus. Um, the idea of wa, of, of harmony, is part of the Japanese national character. This is the way they think of themselves. But that seems to be a post-World War II interpretation of Shotoku and his constitution. In earlier ages, he was celebrated as a proponent of Buddhism, even, even an incarnation of the Buddha. And then when Neo-Confucianism came into Japan and became dominant, then Shotoku was criticized for the same thing, right? He was a person who made Buddhism popular here, and that's sort of caused all, all of our problems. After the Meiji Restoration in 1868, when Japanese nationalism was growing, many people argued that the main message of the Constitution was Article 3, give loyalty and obedience to the emperor. And then there was a shift after World War II. And it may be illustrated by a story about Japanese currency. The American occupation authorities banned the publication of Shinto images that had been associated with emperor worship. And they debated whether they should ban pictures of Prince Shotoku as well, because he had been a symbol of ultra-nationalist patriotism during the war. But the director of the Bank of Japan convinced them that the prince was actually a symbol of pacifism because he had taught that it is noble to have wa. He made it a principle not to have conflicts. Something similar happens to Emperor Hirohito, who was the war emperor, but then after the war, he was thought of as a man of peace because he had encouraged his people to surrender peacefully after, after the atomic bombs were exploded, brought an end to World War II. Shotoku's image was on various Japanese banknotes from 1946 to the mid-1980s. Nowadays on the internet, you can find claims that, that Shotoku invented sushi. Okay, that's not true, but it's a, an, an illustration of how the Japanese still want to give him credit for all sorts of cultural achievements. Okay, you may be asking, so who replaced Prince Shotoku on that 10,000 yen bill? The answer is Fukuzawa Yukichi. We're going to talk about him in Lecture 32. In the year 2000, though, a commemorative 2,000 yen bill was released with an image from the tale of Genji and a picture of its author, Murasaki Shikibu. She's going to be the next great mind in this lecture. Actually, there are two of them, Murasaki Shikibu and Sei Shonagon. Both of them are Japanese. Both of them are women. Both of them are from the same time period. They even knew each other. The Heian period, this is from 794 to 1186, is often thought of as the classical age of traditional Japanese culture. Art and architecture and literature and poetry, they're just wonderful things happening. By this time, though, direct contact with China has come to an end, mostly because of political turmoil in the late Tang Dynasty. But there's still a strong influence of Chinese culture that continues at the Japanese court at Kyoto. Then it was called Heian. That's where we get the name Heian period. Chinese was still the official language of the Japanese government, and male aristocrats were expected to learn Chinese well enough to compose Chinese poetry. Writing in Japanese would have been much easier, 
And consequently, many people felt that that was a mode of expression that was better suited for women. The result of this rather sexist attitude was that Japanese men generally wrote sort of mediocre Chinese poetry, while a few Japanese court women were writing spectacular literature in their native language. These include two women who clearly belong among the great minds of the Eastern intellectual tradition. In Japan, we'll fo focus more on literary figures than we did in India and China. Though, uh, there's great literature in India and China as well. But aesthetics, right, the philosophy of beauty and art and taste, plays a central role in Japanese thought. We don't know much at all about the lives of Murasaki Shikibu and Sei Shonagon. We don't even know their real names. What we do have are titles. Murasaki is the name of one of her book's main characters. Shikibu is the name of a post that was once held by her father. For Sei Shonagon, Sei is a clan name. Shonagon means minor counselor, and it was a position held by some male relative, maybe her father, we're not sure. We'll start with Sei Shonagon. She lives from 966 to 1017. Her father was a minor official, a scholar, and a famous poet. She apparently married and had a child, and then served as a lady-in-waiting to Empress Teishi for seven years, from 993 until Teishi's death in childbirth in 1000 AD. Murasaki Shikibu was slightly younger. She was born about 973 into the prominent Fujiwara clan. Her father was a provincial governor and a scholar of Chinese. She was married at the age of 25, which is rather late for the society, and then was widowed just two years later, at 27. A few years after that, she was summoned to be a lady-in-waiting to Empress Shoshi, and she died around 1014, maybe at the age of 40 or so. Both women knew Chinese fairly well, but such knowledge was considered unladylike. So both of them wrote in Japanese, Murasaki learned Chinese from overhearing her brother's lessons. Um, she was actually quite a bit better at Chinese than he was, which led her father to exclaim, just my luck, what a pity she was not born a man. The two women wrote books that are really the opposite of each other. Lady Murasaki is the author of The Tale of Genji, which is probably the first great novel in world history. It's, a brown, it's about Prince Genji, the son of the emperor and one of his minor wives, and his many love affairs. It's not, however, an erotic work. It focuses on the psychological and emotional aspects of love rather than the physical aspects. Okay. I should mention here that the personal lives of aristocrats in 10th century Japan were rather complicated. Marriages were arranged for sons and daughters in the early teens, and the wife generally continued to live with her parents. Later, a man might marry two or three secondary wives but often husbands lived in, in separate households from their wives. Love was not generally connected to marriage, and affairs were accepted for both men and women. Now, Genji cuts a striking figure in this world. He's the ideal gentleman. He's handsome and elegant. He's a great lover, a talented dancer, a musician, and a poet. He's generous. He's thoughtful. Even after an amorous relationship has come to an end, he is still unfailingly gracious and kind to his former lovers. And the women, as described by Lady Murasaki, are not all interchangeable. Genji comes to know them as individuals, but he never seems to find exactly what he's looking for. The great love of his life, a girl named Murasaki, is the character that the, we named the author for, she belonged to a slightly lower social station, and though he eventually marries her as a secondary wife, the complications of his other marriages and his dalliances and political intrigues all take their toll. When Murasaki dies, this is the, the character in the novel, right, childless in her 40s, Genji is devastated and he comes to realize his own failings, the happiness that he's brought to others, sorry, the unhappiness that he's brought to others, and the inevitable passing of things. You notice some Buddhist overtones here. The Tale of Genji is a long novel with 54 chapters and a thousand pages. The action takes place over the course of 70 years and there are about 50 important characters. Lady Murasaki writes with elegance and delicacy. She also includes 795 poems in her novel. Okay. This is how Japanese aristocrats at the time fell in love. You don't catch a glimpse of a stranger across a crowded room, but instead you catch a glimpse of someone's calligraphy and you say, my goodness, such taste, such refinement. I really ought to get to know the writer of that better. 
But what makes this novel still very much worth reading today are the realistic, nuanced observations of emotion and of psychology. I'll give you just one quick example. The lady, when no answer came from Genji, thought that he had changed his mind. And though she would have been very angry if he had persisted in his suit, she was not quite prepared to lose him with so little ado. But this was a good opportunity once and for all to lock her heart against him. She thought that she had done so successfully, but found to her surprise that he still occupied an uncommonly large share of her thoughts. Okay, so this affair is cooling down. Does she love him? Does she not love him? Does she want to pray or does she? These are sort of common feelings, perhaps even among us, a thousand years later. The next book is The Pillow Book uh, by Seisho Nagome. And this is a collection of wry observations of complaints, uh, lists, and musings on court life and on culture. Where the tale of Ganji is long and complex and filled with pathos, the contents of the pillow book are short, random, and often kind of funny. The odd title comes from a conversation that Seishonagon had with the Empress, who had just received a gift of paper. And paper was a very valuable commodity at the time. Um, the Empress had said, I'm not sure what to do with this. A similar gift had gone to her husband, the Emperor, and he was having a copy of Sima Chen's Records of the Scribes, the Shirji copied onto his gift. That seemed like a noble thing to do. She said, what should I do with my paper? And Seisho Nagon said, let's make them into a pillow. By what she meant, let's, let's bind them into blank notebooks that we can place by our pillow when we go to sleep, and then that'll give us a, a place where we can jot down stray thoughts or ideas that we might have. She said, fine. And so uh, apparently she gave these notebooks to Seisho Nagon. Um, Seisho Nagon was obviously intelligent and quick-witted. She's witty. She's observant. Though she can also be sort of dismissive of those she considered beneath her. But her work is a celebration of refinement and taste. She makes lots of observations here. For example, she says that preachers should be good looking so that we pay close attention to what they say. If we look away, we may forget to listen. So ugly preachers can often be the source of sin. And the great translator Arthur Whaley once said that his favorite passage from the pillow book was this. I love to cross a river in very bright moonlight and see the trampled water fly up in chips of crystal under the oxen's feet. It's just a very descriptive description. Let me give you some more. Um, in the pillow book, she includes 164 lists, things that are regrettable, things that are admirable, embarrassing things, hateful things, elegant things, etc. Let me just share a few of these with you because they're, they're just so much fun. So these are things that make you feel nostalgic. Um, and they include things children use in doll play. On a rainy day, when time hangs heavy, searching out an old letter that touched you deeply at the time you received it. Remember, we're after nostalgia here. Last year's summer fan. Another list, things that make one uncomfortable. Someone relays a bit of gossip without knowing that the subject is listening. Even if the person is only a servant, this makes one feel uncomfortable. The doting parents of an unattractive young child pet him and play with him and repeat his sayings imitating his voice. It's kind of irritating. When someone is wide awake, chattering away, it's disconcerting if a companion simply lies there half asleep. And then one more, something that makes her uncomfortable. Someone performs complacently on an out-of-tune zither in front of an expert musician. Um, here's a list about things that have lost their power. A large boat which is high and dry in a creek at ebb tide. A large tree that has been blown down in a gale and lies on its side with its root in the air. Remember, things that have lost their power. The retreating figure of a sumo wrestler who's been defeated in a match. And then this last example. A woman who is angry with her husband about some trifling matter leaves home and goes somewhere to hide. She's certain that he'll rush about looking for her, but he does nothing of the kind and shows the most infuriating indifference. Since she cannot stay away forever, she swallows her pride and returns. Again, things that have lost their power. Okay, now for some theory. Um, I, I want to introduce two terms that are important in Japanese aesthetics, awari and okashi. Now, mono no awari, 
which is sometimes just shortened to awari, is a sensitivity to things. It's, it's a capacity to be moved by things, especially those things that are tinged with sadness, such as the fall of a flower or the passage of time. Awari is a primary characteristic of the tale of Genji, as you follow Genji through many years and sort of see the impermanence of all things. And, you, and you're moved by that. Okashi is something quite different. It, it's something that brings a smile to one's face, either in delight or in amusement. It's much lighter and, and more charming than Aware, and it's oftentimes associated with Seishonagon's pillow book. Okay, what striking opposites. Though they both come from the same time and the same place and the same culture, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that even though the court in Kyoto borrowed extensively from Chinese culture, what emerges in Japan is quite distinctive. It, there's nothing quite like Aware and Okashi in China. Murasaki Shikibu and Seishonagon apparently knew each other, but I'm not sure that they were friends. Uh, they, they were more like rivals. And in her diary, Lady Murasaki wrote this a few years after Seishonagon had left the court. She said, get this right? Seishonagon was dreadfully conceited. She thought herself so clever and littered her writings with Chinese characters. But if you examine them closely, they left a great deal to be desired. Those who think of themselves as being superior to everyone else in this way will inevitably suffer and come to a bad end. And people who try to capture every moment of interest, however slight, remember all those lists, they're bound to look ridiculous and superficial. How can the future turn out well for them? Okay, that may seem a little bit snarky. Morisaki's critical of pride and she's concerned with reputation. Yet she also shows an awareness of how things can change. And there's perhaps a hint of compassion there. Perhaps. She does, so like how can a person like that, uh, things turn out well for a person like that? But remember, a refined culture, and Heian culture, is ex court culture, is extremely refined. It needs sharp criticism to keep up standards, to keep everybody on their toes. But Murasaki takes the edge off that criticism by almost immediately criticizing herself. Remember the Japanese ideals of harmony and humility that, that we saw in Shotoku's constitution. She continues in her diary um, uh, lamenting that she hasn't accomplished much herself and then says, and when I play my zither rather badly to myself in the cool breeze of the evening, I worry that someone might hear me and recognize how I'm just adding to the sadness of it all. How vain and sad of me. Okay, the last word will lead to Prince Genji, who in a discussion of the varieties of Japanese literature observed that to dismiss all these types of fiction as so much falsehood is surely to miss the point. For even in the law that the Buddha in his great mercy bequeathed to us, there are parts known as skillful means. Remember the parable of the burning house and the Lotus Sutra that he says different things to different people so that different people can, can respond to that. Okay, continue with Genji's quote. So when we regard these works of fiction in their proper light, we find that they contain nothing superfluous. Okay, so here you have a fictional character commenting on the nature of fiction. It's, it's almost postmodern, kind of. It's sort of an interesting situation. From a harmonizing Buddhist perspective, like that of Prince Shotoku, each type of literature has a role to play in bringing about a greater awareness and understanding of life. In this lecture, we've seen how Japanese thinkers borrowed ideas and institutions from China and then used them to create a distinct, rich culture of their own. We'll see more of this in the next lecture when we talk about Buddhism in Japan. I'll see you then.